Welcome back, travelers. We are reading the fifth chapter of War of the Spark. And this particular chapter is about Liliana Vess. Before we get into the specifics of this particular chapter, I would like to note that starting with the Monday following this one, since this is a Monday, that Monday we're going to start talking about the prequel chapters, which will have come out, and it's actually come out at the time of this recording. So uh, to give people a week to read the chapter and then come and discuss it. It's free, everyone has access to it, so I feel like it'd be, it'd be fair to do that. Yeah, the videos are gonna be different on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, like different kinds of stuff, but Monday will always be a prequel chapter. Uh, I don't know, it depends on how people feel about these particular things, whether or not we're gonna continue reading from War of the Spark itself. That said, chapter five, Liliana Vess. Now, you may remember Liliana as the person that Gideon was looking for, Chandra was upset about, uh, Jason Trust, all that fun stuff. Liliana is a necromancer, so her big thing is that she can make zombies rise from the dead. Um, and if, if you're the kind of person that is willing to make the undead rise, you probably don't have much respect for the corpse or for anyone really. Liliana kind of plays into that field where she doesn't really care about what others want. She doesn't really care about how the badly the consequences may be. If she wants something, if she feels like she is going to become stronger because of something, then it's worth doing it. Um, I've always seen Liliana as being very black red, although she's always just been mono black. Um, but I feel like the red aspects of her character have, have become much more prominent as the story has progressed. And, uh, well, I guess I can just give you a quick rundown. She was a healer at first, which was basically mono white, and black red being the exact opposite. She was not fit for that. Uh, she wound up making her zombie, uh, her brother turn to a zombie, which was a bad time for everyone involved. She has this person called the Raven Man basically in her head. Uh, a lot of people say it might be Lim Duel, others say it could be Leshrac. Lim Duel sounds like it'd be more fun, Lim Duel's a whole other character entirely, I could talk about him, but that's beside the point. But the point really is, is that she has constantly been trying to get out of messes she puts herself into. When the mending happened, all the planeswalkers stopped being all super powerful godlike beings, and instead became more mortal. They age properly, they die when they should, stuff like that. Uh, in the case of Liliana, she did not like that. She didn't like that she started getting all wrinkly. As a result, she basically went to the magic equivalent of a uh, plastic surgeon, which is uh, apparently demons. They basically made deals and put these etchings on her skin so that she could keep her youth and her power and her mm, mentality of not going senile. All that stuff that goes with being young, she got to keep. And she was completely okay with that. She was not okay with having to make a deal with demons, though, uh, in the fact that she would have to pay them back. So instead of that, she found this artifact that one of them had sent her to get, and then she started systematically killing each of them Kill Bill style. In the end, she got rid of all four of them, thanks to Gideon's help, Bola shows up, and Bola's is like, Hey, now you belong to me. And she's like, what? And he goes, I'm the one that helped make your contract, so with all of them dead, I now own you. And so he does. He whisked her away, and she is now forced to work for him, as she does in this book. So now we get to see Liliana's perspective as she's standing there on a giant platform, Nicobolas basically there, smiling the entire time. He does a lot of smiling and standing in this book. Uh, and Tezzeret right next to uh, next to them. And Tezzeret's using his metallurgy powers. He's basically this uh, an artificer mage. He works with artifacts, he works with metal, and he can do some really cool stuff with it. Uh, metallurgic, I think would be the best uh, term. Not allergic to metal, but with metallurgy. Um, like a thaumaturge, which is just a classic way of saying magic. Um, so basically, what Tezzeret does is he starts building all these structures and stuff for Bolas because he wants him to. And uh, after he's done doing that, uh, Bolas is like, this is very nice, I am happy with this. And Tezzeret's like, you made a giant target. They're all going to know exactly where you are and exactly where to go to kill you. And Bolas is like, Oh, 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 oh. You want a target? And he builds a statue basically out of nothing and plops it down in the middle of a plaza. And he's like, now that's a target. That's a knife. And um, Tezzeret's like, okay, whatever. So Bolas then tells Tezzeret to do his thing. Tez uh, Tezzeret basically opens, like his chest opens up 
into a void, and then his entire body implodes into it before he winks out of existence, which is his way of planeswalking. Um, the idea being that he is that, um, he's blue-black, so his is kind of like similar in a way to te uh, to fairies, because to fairy returned to a whirlwind and disappeared. Uh, that blueness, but the difference being the white and the black aspects of the character. It's really interesting how they, they took into account the character's methods of planeswalking and how they're very unique in the sense that like even if you're the same color, they're slightly different. Like Jai is a more controlled fire, Chandra is a more <laughs> fire, so I, I like that. Basically, after Tezret leaves, Bolas tells Liliana it's time for her to do her part, and Liliana's not excited about it. And this is actually right here, it talks about just what Liliana sees when she's here. This is a city, it's like a beautiful city with these massive skyscrapers that are so artistically designed and it's just a it's a it's a wonderful place to be and this is what this is what she sees this is how she feels in the last moments of this chapter it says it was a beautiful morning it had rained just before dawn and the air now tasted crisp and clean the sun had risen just a few minutes ago and the skies bore the colors of ripe plums and peaches Knowing what was in store for this day, Liliana felt like crying. And a part of her wanted to cry, wished she could cry, but there were no tears. The woman that could allow herself to cry was a century gone, and she possessed no necromancy powerful enough to bring that woman back to life, nor to raise actual tears from soul-dead eyes. Liliana has made some mistakes, lots and lots of mistakes. She is not a smart individual, I would say. She is an ambitious one. She has allowed what she wants to get in the way of what is right. And she has paid for it. Uh, she was realizing that in Dominaria's, uh, the Dominaria story. But she is still paying for the things she's done. And she probably will be paying for those things for a while. Um, the fact that she is in this state, she's given up and she doesn't really know what else to do. No one can beat Nicol Bolas, especially with her on their side, because she was a gambit. She had the chain veil, and she was gonna be powerful. And now she's she's just there, and she's gonna be working for him. Uh, spoilers, there's a giant zombie army on the way. They're called the Eternals, and Bolas intends to use her as their commander. I think general, yes. The, yes, to command the Dread Horde. As it's called. With that, this particular chapter is done. It was a bit uh, f uh, quicker, a little bit. It wasn't that much to it. Uh, thank you for watching. Please leave a like or a comment or all the other fun stuff that goes along with YouTube. And uh, I'll see you guys again in the next episode. But until then, travel well.